Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wi-Fi Now TV. I'm your host, Klaus Hetting, and on this week's show, we've got two great guests. First of all, Edgar Figueroa, sorry, CEO of Wi-Fi Alliance. We're going to ask him about LTEU uh, versus Wi-Fi coexistence, of course, and talk about the latest innovation in Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi Aware. Also, how, seam how carriers can build a seamless Wi-Fi network as part of their HetNet. We'll talk to you. CEO of Birdstep, Lonnie Schilling. Join us right after this. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Two excellent guests today that I think you'll enjoy. And uh, before we get to them, I just want to do my usual personal plug because Wi-Fi Now, the conference, of course, is coming up. And that's next week in Amsterdam. If you're in the U.S. or anywhere else, you can still make it. We've got a small handful of tickets left. Uh, otherwise, we're jam-packed at Wi-Fi Now, the conference. Uh, go to wi-fi now events.com slash Europe and check out our program and drop me a line at klaus at wi-fi now events.com. If you're interested, I'm happy to answer all of your questions. Now, for our first guest, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Edgar Figueroa. And um, uh, Edgar, of course, has been uh, in, in the news recently trying to resolve the LTEU versus Wi-Fi issue. And honestly, from my point of view, I think you should have a medal for, for doing all of that great work in support of the Wi-Fi industry and try to resolve that issue. Edgar, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Klaus. Thank, uh, thanks for the invitation to be here, and uh, thanks for the kind words. Well, you're welcome. Now, Edgar, let's uh, cut straight to the chase regarding LTEU versus Wi-Fi. Um, you've proposed several solutions to the issue. Of course, the Wi-Fi Alliance has proposed several solutions to the issue, including uh, so-called coexistence guidelines. Uh, can you start by explaining to us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. Um, let me let me start first, uh, just uh, by not assuming that your audience that knows what Wi-Fi Alliance is. So maybe I can just say a few words about that. Uh, so Wi-Fi Alliance is the worldwide network of companies that brings you Wi-Fi. Um, for the past 16 years, we have worked in cooperation to continue to make Wi-Fi uh, better and better. And today, there are about seven billion Wi-Fi devices in use uh, as a result of our work. Uh, currently in Wi-Fi Alliance, we have about 700 companies working on new technologies, working on certification to ensure Wi-Fi meets user expectations, and advocating for consumers' interests uh, throughout the world. Uh, our member companies represent all the brands that you would know from um, the phone in your pocket to your broadband service provider to the car that you drive. Likely all those companies are represented in Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, so I often tell people that uh, if you have used Wi-Fi, you have benefited from our work. Actually, um, yeah, good that you bring up bring that up. I was actually going to ask you about that so, because I think a lot of people get uh, standardization work confused with certification work, and, and Wi-Fi Alliance actually does not do uh, standardization work, or do you? We, uh, on occasion, you know, some of the technology that we develop may become de facto standards, uh, meaning that uh, you know, we don't go through, you know, the formal process that you would have at, at IEEE or some other um, standard setting organization. But we develop technologies nonetheless, and by virtue of those becoming tremendously popular, they become de facto standards. Mm -hmm. A good example, for example, is WPA, or a good example would be a Wi-Fi protected setup. You know, these are technologies that are tremendously popular. Soon you'll hear about Passpoint, uh, which is becoming, you know, very, very popular. So all of those technologies didn't go through ITF or, or uh, IEEE or anything like that. They, they were uh, developed in-house in Wi-Fi Alliance because there was a gap that we uh, needed to address. We have all of the technical powers in Wi-Fi Alliance to do that kind of work. Um, so when that's needed and, and it prevents uh, either microgrowth or, uh, is an impediment to a terrific user experience with Wi-Fi. We'll get involved and we'll address that. All right. All right. Very good. So, Edgar, take us a little bit through the LTEU versus Wi-Fi issue as seen from your point of view. And obviously, you've been extremely busy in recent, recent months uh, addressing this issue in various ways. Can you tell us, first of all, what you mean by the coexistence guidelines and 
the fairness rules and so forth. Right. Um, so let me sort of build up to that, if you don't mind. Um, so our involvement in representing the interests of all Wi-Fi users at the dawn of uh, LTU is just one example of the critical role Wi-Fi Alliance plays in uh, today's connected world. So we're championing Wi-Fi users' interests by ensuring that uh, if LTE is deployed in a licensed spectrum, uh, it does not have a disproportionate or unfair uh, effect on the consumer experience. Uh, and our goal in, in this work is uh, to ensure that um, unlicensed spectrum is shared fairly with Wi-Fi. Um, so uh, toward that goal, we're going to work in cooperation with all industry to make sure that, uh, you know, all of the things that uh, we believe uh, need to be taken into account toward that goal of fairness with Wi-Fi are, are indeed taken into account. Um, so we're progressing, uh, you know, in that continuum toward that goal um, as a first step. Uh, with a set of coexistence guidelines, which was a document we published recently. Uh, in this document, we establish some of the parameters, some of the key performance indicators or KPIs that the industry will need to pay attention to um, uh, so that uh, it understands these are the things that matter to Wi-Fi coexistence. These are the things that uh, in rolling out a service, um, you will need to pay attention to so as not to impair Wi-Fi operation. And um, it, sort of the, the next step, which we're also uh, handling um, toward that goal of ensuring fairness uh, with Wi-Fi, is to take uh, those guidelines and um, uh, take them from something that's abstract into something that's real and tactical and executable by virtue of a test program or a test plan. Um, and so, you know, we'll take sort of those KPIs and those uh, elements that we're outlining in the guidelines and develop a test protocol um, against which every LTU device sh should be uh, characterized. And uh, at the end of that, that will go a long way toward uh, providing some assurances for fairness to Wi-Fi. And, and how are these guidelines, uh, in your view, being received by the mobile industry? Obviously, you've got a lot of vested interest in, in pushing LTEU in its current form. Right. So uh, we unveiled these coexistence guidelines uh, publicly at a workshop that we held last week, as you might have heard, and uh, they were uh, very well received. You know, broadly, they were understood to capture, um, you know, the right parameters that are going to be important for everyone to track in, in equipment that's operating in unlicensed. Um, so you know, we believe it was uh, even it was it was very well received and a positive first step for for us all to get on the same page. Um, it, it makes sense that we have uh, this set of guidelines because they provide a common definition, um, you know, for those things to measure. And, uh, you know, eventually, of course, uh, you will continue to take input toward the evolution of those guidelines. Uh, but we're immediately following on that work with um, a, a particular, you know, test document that we're developing and, um, and uh, as a result of the workshop that we had, we, we have commitment from LTU stakeholders that they will engage in Wi-Fi Alliance in helping us evolve that test plan. Well, that's fantastic news, I think, uh, coming out of that workshop. And, and I commend you for doing so much hard work in this area because obviously it's, it's an issue that could potentially affect uh, a lot of people. Uh, and con a lot of connectivity to the internet via Wi-Fi, of course. But on that note, uh, in, in your view, how do you see the, the size of the risk? How big is the risk uh, of LTEU in its current form, in the unadulterated form, if you like, uh, for damaging uh, everyday Wi-Fi that everybody uses? Well, our, our goal is to mitigate, mitigate any risk to the, to the uh, experience that users have currently with Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. You know, Wi-Fi is uh, one of the world's most loved technologies. And uh, so the good news is that we have, you know, all of these companies that represent, uh, you know, the diversity in the Wi-Fi industry uh, working uh, in cooperation in Wi-Fi lines to make sure that we have the proper testing in place. Um, at the workshop, we were hit with some good news that there's agreement that more specificity in the LTU specification improves uh, LTU and that it brings uh, better understanding, uh, you know, about how any, any kind of risk is mitigated. Uh, there was also agreement that the Wi-Fi Alliance test protocol is sensible 
in agreement that uh, uh, the broader ecosystem is going to be supporting that test development effort. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're, you know, we're making uh, steps uh, steadily toward making sure that risks are addressed before we have LTEU uh, presenting any kind of real threat to Wi-Fi. So very good steps towards uh, industry consensus, I would say, and, and, and very positive remarks from you today, and very happy to hear that. Uh, in general, do you support the view that the FCC should not get involved in this and industry consensus is the road ahead, or, or how do you see this? We believe that industry should be able to take care of this issue on its own, and uh, at the same time, we believe that the uh, the stakes are high enough that regulators need to continue to pay attention to what is happening in the event that uh, we are not able to. And in, and in that event, of course, um, all options should remain on the table because uh, naturally Wi-Fi is critical. Uh, you probably saw that um, we recently had some surveys that we did and uh, the surveys uh, tell us that over 70% of people believe their work productivity would be impaired if Wi-Fi were impaired. So, you know, they really tie their productivity to Wi-Fi. And uh, that's just sort of one, you know, one measure of the relevance of Wi-Fi today. And, and so naturally, I think uh, uh, we all share this interest in making sure that Wi-Fi is not impaired for the billions of Wi-Fi users out there. Absolutely. So last question regarding LTEU, and then we're gonna go and in, get into something else, something more uh, forward looking. Um, if you were to look into your crystal ball, where do you think this issue will eventually land? It's been going on now for, what, six months or more at least. Um, what's your view on that? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you we are um, working toward a, a proper uh, test protocol. And we have uh, all of the stakeholders have said that this is something that they're interested in. All of the stakeholders, and by that I mean not just Wi-Fi interests, but LTEU interests, have said that they uh, would like to see proper testing in place and uh, coexistence assured uh, and fairness assured uh, through you know, all of these KPIs and all of the LTEU gear being tested. So uh, in the future, I would expect, uh, you know, A, that we would have consensus around what that testing is, and uh, we're working together um, very soon here to start to make that happen, and then B, that all of the devices will go uh, through the testing to make sure that uh, there are no risks with LTEU deployments. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the comments on LTEU, and that has been an ongoing theme on this show. It's a hot issue, of course, and that's why we keep covering it, and thank you so much for that. But I do want to speak to you about something a little bit more forward-looking about innovation in the Wi-Fi space, because you launched, you know, I forget exactly, this a few months ago, I think, a certification program for Wi-Fi Aware, and I'd like you to tell us a little bit about Wi-Fi Aware. Uh, thank you, uh, Klaus, for bringing that up. this up. Sometimes we lose uh, sight of you know all of the other things that are going on in the industry. But Wi-Fi Aware is a very exciting development, and it's indeed uh, um, a, a new set of protocols. You you started off uh, today by asking me uh, about whether we are a standards uh, setting organization, and, and we're not, except for sometimes our our technologies become de facto standards, and Wi-Fi Aware may present you know the, uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, Wi-Fi Aware uh, delivers an always-on, real-time discovery of what is available nearby and provides an immediate uh, on-ramp uh, to rich experiences for the end user. Um, the kinds of experiences that people, uh, you know, covet today with the kind of capabilities that they're afforded with the mobile phones. Um, it, so, you know, things like being able to uh, know about your environment and know what the next experience that you can have uh, could be and having applications that leverage all of that intelligence toward a, a, a very simple click to do uh, before you're even connected. Um, and in many cases, uh, these capabilities uh, do not necessitate that you, that you have uh, either GPS or cellular or even a Wi-Fi connection. So we're pretty excited about this, uh, this development and, and the, sort of the dawn of the Wi-Fi aware age. Fantastic. And except for you guys, and I've been following you guys in your announcements in this area because I do think it's exciting. We've not heard so much about, uh, you know, what various companies are going to do with this and apps and, and various applications, other kinds of applications. 
uh, how do you see, what, in what direction do you see this going? We're talking about gaming. Somebody said at one point it was a, it was a godsend to the dating app industry and things like that. So, so how do you see that? Uh, Wi-Fi Wear is, um, it, it's a lot like many of our other programs in that it provides a platform for innovation. And it's a terrific platform of that. We have heard in, in briefings that we've done a, a wide variety of concepts that people think about when we start to explain what's possible with Wi-Fi Wear. And so, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, currently we're at the very early stages of adoption. You know, th there's, uh, Wi-Fi Wear has been incorporated in, in silicon um, uh, as, of, as of now. But really, when we'll see the floodgates open is when uh, you have the capability for Wi-Fi aware applications embedded in operating systems natively. And when we have that, uh, developers will be able to, um, uh, to be really creative by interacting with the OS through, a, through an API and creating all sorts of experiences that, uh, that uh, we have only imagined up to now. Yeah, I, I think that I think it's fantastic. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things happening. When when I first was reading through, you know, the the, the material that you presented on your website about Wi-Fi aware, aware it uh, it occurred to me that it, it, it characterization of it might also be something like iBeacon on steroids because it does have that kind of ability as well. Or how, how do you see that? Uh, you know, some folks compare it to other technologies. Um, you know, we think that given how rich it is and the menu of available options that you have with Wi-Fi aware, it, it will be, you know, completely different and, and uh, you know, potentially revolutionizing in terms of what people will be able to do with it. Uh, part, part of uh, the reason it's so rich is that it's fully uh, bi-directional. Uh, so the communication can really happen two way. I'll give you a quick example of something that uh, someone brought up to me as something, you know, this reporter sort of thought of uh, on their own as I was explaining Wi-Fi Aware. Uh, they said, well, I happen to be vegetarian. This means wherever I go, if I walk into a restaurant, my phone will just, just tell the restaurant that I'm vegetarian. And so, uh, you know, the specials of the day that the, the staff person rolls off when they approach me, uh, will not be all of these things I don't need to hear. They'll be, you know, talking to me exactly about the dietary needs that I have because they'll know that from, you know, from me being in that in that environment at that particular table. Uh, so that's exactly, you know, it, that that takes, uh, you know, that person walking into the restaurant uh, enabling some sort of app to share that about themselves, and it takes the restaurant being able to communicate, you know, that without even either of them having established that connection with each other. Sure. Uh, it's a great example, and, and it's just a blue ocean of, of opportunity for all sorts of startups and, and big companies and so forth to really take this to market in all sorts of creative ways. I really like that. Uh, can, can you say a little bit about um, your progress on the certification of it? And I suppose it's on your website, which companies have, have certified chipsets and so forth, so forth, but maybe take us through that a little bit. Right. So, you know, we spent, uh, I would say, a few years developing this, uh, the particular technology. And then, of course, we uh, spent some time developing the, test the testing to ensure, you know, products um, adequately implement the technology. And uh, when we launched the program, uh, the, the major silicon vendors uh, were part of uh, the, the test suite, the reference set uh, of uh, uh, first devices that incorporated Wi-Fi aware. Uh, you know, my, my, and so those, those devices are all certified and that ability uh, uh, is there for those chipset vendors. You know, my, my sense is that the next wave is probably going to come through uh, either, uh, you know, the major OS is implementing this, uh, just like we saw for Miracast, the, the screen mirroring, screen sharing application. Once the OS vendors implemented that, you know, it's really become, you know, very popular now. So that's, that's probably the next thing that will happen. And um, alternatively, you know, some folks that are particularly excited about this may start developing apps uh, that interact directly uh, with, uh, with those chipsets uh, to enable these applications. And when do you think, uh, you know, devices and apps and that, all of that might hit the markets as far as Wi-Fi aware is concerned? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to really know when these things are going to happen. You know, to some extent, uh, it, it could be dependent on the OS release cycles. Um, and, uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, it, it could also be that uh, uh, 
that some folks, you know, go ahead and roll out apps that um, interact uh, differently with devices. So, uh, you know, I'd hesitate to say on that, Klaus. Okay. Well, Edgar, I thank you for coming on the show. It's as always a, a big pleasure to speak to you, and I wish you lots of good luck on LTEU and all of the rest of it. And you're doing a fantastic job for the Wi-Fi industry, so we commend you. And please come back and talk to us again. My pleasure, Klaus. Thanks. Thank you. All right, everybody, on to our next, next guest, excuse me. And we have uh, Lonnie Schilling, CEO of Birdstep, uh, as our second guest of this show. And that comes with a story because Lonnie is actually coming to us uh, right now from Frankfurt Airport via an iPad. And uh, Lonnie, are you with us? <laughs> yes, I am, Klaus. How are you this evening? Very good. Good to see you. We haven't seen each other for a long time. It's great to see you again. It's been a while. We'll, we'll, well, we'll see you, uh, what, next week in Amsterdam? Next week, you're coming to the Wi-Fi Now Amsterdam show. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Great stuff. So, Lonnie, uh, just to give our viewers the, 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 the overview of what Birdstep does, just take two minutes, minutes to explain that. Yeah, sure. No, thanks. Um, so Birdstep, um, we sit at the intersection today of where cellular and Wi-Fi technologies are meeting. Uh, up until very recently, we've worked predominantly with mobile operators, with the MVNOs, MSOs, the OEMs, in bringing solutions together to address what I would say a, an older uh, use case, Wi-Fi offload. And we've been doing this for a few years now. We've deployed into some tier one networks and we've been focusing very much on a, a handset or a device driven policy solution that the operators can control and then traffic steer or what we call intelligent network selection from the device. So we've been doing this for a few years now. We've uh, been evolving our solutions to today where we're looking more and more at the HetNet solution. Um, we're working with um, a lot of operators today where you can almost envision a control plane that resides on top of the technology that can give the end device a level of intelligence on what situations, what circumstances would it use a Wi-Fi signal or would it actually use a cellular bearer, whether it's application driven, whether it's network quality driven, time-based location, things of that nature and um, evolving very much into um, an intrinsic big data application, big data analytics capability um, on top of the platform as well. So that's really where we've been. That's really a lot of what we're doing. More interesting is where we're going from here though, I think. Yes, absolutely. And I wanted to ask you about how you see the market for well, we used to call it offload, right? And I, I'm, I'm guilty of calling it offload for, for a number of years. And I don't even like that word myself anymore. I do like the word mobile Wi-Fi convergence, however, because I think that adds a different perspective to it. So we are starting to see, uh, obviously with Google Project Fi and a number of other MBNOs, this, uh, this convergence of mobile and Wi-Fi. How do you see the market? Because you speak to a lot of folks out there, uh, obviously at the senior level. How are they reacting to what you propose in terms of convergence here? Yeah, no, you're right. And, and you and I have had a number of discussions um, around offload and the use of, and, and the understanding of offload as a use case. Yeah. But, you know, nevertheless, that's really where all of this started. And, you know, I, I think the offload use case really started in, in North America, and it was addressing the issue of contention on the cellular networks. And there's a very interesting um, um, survey report brought out earlier this year by Rethink uh, Research. And they were talking to a number of operators around the world. And at that point in time, the operators were saying there was, there was I believe it was 86% of the operators addressed in this survey said that Wi-Fi was a tool that they had successfully used to reduce their TCO for delivering data services. And of those same operators, they were saying, I, I believe it was 43% saying that Wi-Fi offload was an effective tool in reducing churn. But saying that today, you call it convergence, I agree. Regardless of what you call it, we're seeing a much tighter integration uh, between cellular and, um, and, and Wi-Fi networks. Now, whether it happens at the bearer plane, like Edgar was talking about with LTEU, 
uh, whether it's happening at the control plane, much like what we're beginning to see today with het nets, um, or whether it's at the services plane where you're seeing much more of the OTT and the cloud-based uh, propositions come to play. But nevertheless, the het net strategies themselves today, they're being driven more and more by well, continues to be a focus on churn reduction and reducing their TCO for delivering services, mm -hmm. but more emphasis is, is, is putting today on, on revenue creation. And along with that, we're also seeing that um, there's a desire for enhanced knowledge of the consumer as well. Um, new revenue creation, I think, is becoming really critical from tighter integration of cellular and Wi-Fi. Uh, particularly because the, the access line business models that the operators have been using for the last 150 years are really becoming outdated um, and are becoming overtaken by, by a newer, I'd say a margin-based business model. What we do see is that operators are requiring a much more flexible, a much more adaptive uh, network that can address many differing uh, business models concurrently as well. Um, certainly services like TV Everywhere, uh, connected car, um, wearables, critical M2M applications, smart health, but I think more importantly, it's, it's the ability to be flexible enough to address probably a number of models coming out of the whole IoT space that we really even have, uh, haven't begun to think about yet. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask you, because in, in your position, the, the, the solutions that you represent that Burn Step works with, you're actually spanning an enormous, uh, shall we say, slice of the ecosystem here, because Obviously, you work with mobile operators. Uh, you could, presumably, if you don't already, work with MSOs and, uh, and MVNOs. And I wanted to ask you specifically about MVNOs because that's an area where we're seeing a lot of interest, of course, in Wi-Fi first. But then there's the whole device side as well, where this kind of device intelligence, device policy, and so forth uh, is, is more and more needed. So how do you navigate that? And how do you see yourself in that ecosystem? You raise an interesting point. Um, you know, one of the things we've been recognizing um, that there's actually multiple ecosystems. Um, and we're discovering now that there is viable need outside of what I'll say our more traditional ecosystem around telecom. But nevertheless, you know, our, our, our value proposition has and does continue to address uh, the MNO. Um, certainly the MVNO, as you're touching upon, the MSO, the cable operators are also big Wi-Fi users, um, but also the OEMs. You know, it's, it has a lot to do with improving the customer experience. Um, it has a lot to do with reducing their, T, their TCO, lowering churn rates, uh, creating deeper knowledge of, the, of the, the consumer's digital lifestyle. But really, it's, 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 it's interesting now because we're beginning to look at this from the approach of, what's actually better from the, for the consumer as opposed to you know what's better for the operator who's trying to control this how do you bring that control and that value directly to the consumer and you know by we're beginning to work with OTTs a, a lot of app vendors um, very much in early phase but particularly around streaming apps video applications audio applications did we lose the smartest oh, type of service uh, you know, in, in, in order to better, uh, you know, better the consumer's experience? Um, and, and the ecosystem players also that are addressing a, a much more efficient network architecture. You know, you're thinking some of the CDN guys that are looking to bridge you know, the, this fixed world with the mobile world and to become much more app aware also. Mm -hmm. um, but really the interesting thing that we're getting involved with, and I'll, I'll admit it's still pretty much a wild card for us, is we're starting to move outside the ecosystem of telecom. And, and in particular, um, we're beginning to work with customer consumer research, uh, research firms that are trying to better understand and, and model digital habits of consumers. And you know, much of that today is really driven by this, this mobile you know, digital lifestyle. So the notion of the ecosystem is it's exploding on us right now and it's going in all different directions and we're learning things that a year ago we really weren't even contemplating. Fantastic. And you're in a super, super fertile space where there's, a, there's obviously a lot of opportunity spanning these various uh, parts of the ecosystem. How do you see uh, your competitors? Because 
some of the intelligence in some of the technology that you provide is perhaps something that also is being developed in-house by obviously the big uh, uh, device vendors and so forth. How do you position yourself there? You bring up a very, a, a very good point. I mean, this is, I mean, let's, let's be obvious, uh, let's be honest here. This is still somewhat an embryonic space. Um, there is significant growth potential opportunity and everybody's going after it. You have to understand though, um, for each of the players in this ecosystem, they're gonna stake out a piece of this that they believe they can contribute and bring value to, but equally there's a business case for them to be made. And, and we're seeing this with, with various players and you, you touched on, on the OEMs, device manufacturers. We work with a lot of the device manufacturers and um, they them themselves are, are obviously focusing very much on bringing more and more value to the consumer um, and they often ask themselves if, if we stake out this piece of ground in this space what's the business case for, for us where do we fit is it better to you know it's the age-old story do we do we develop in-house do we partner do we acquire mm -hmm. so it, it's a fair discussion to get into and we're in these discussions with a lot of players and that's why to your point we continue to innovate because we cannot sit on our laurels because what we were doing three years ago, there's a lot of composite competition out there doing it today. And, and to your point, we'll continue to innovate to either stay ahead of the curve um, or to, to certainly map out the, the right partnerships that bring value to that partner, to us and to the consumer. Right, absolutely. And on that note, I think it's uh, no secret that you've been working with Sprint uh, for a number of years. Is there anything in that partnership you'd like to highlight? I know, I know that that has been, is still successful, it's ongoing, right? Is, and is there anything new on the horizon or that you'd like to tell us about? Let's see, um, <laughs> that's a tricky question. The relationship with Sprint has gone back um, three years. It's been, um, it's been for us a very rewarding relationship in a number of areas, but it's also allowed us to be very close to a a tier one operator that's at the forefront of trying to increase their value proposition to their consumer. And in doing so, we've been rewarded in understanding a lot of the challenges that they've been having and in turn, allowing us to innovate to address those needs. You know, often you call it a, a white a lighthouse account or something along those lines. We're at the, we're, you know, we're very much on in the front lines right now together with uh, sprint, understanding the industry, understanding their needs, and um, the needs that they perceive that they're going to be having in a couple of years and developing towards that. It's no secret that um, a lot of what we've developed has come at that request and out of understanding Sprint's challenges and where they're going in the future. Um, we've, uh, we've brought out some, some new products together with Sprint um, over the last couple of years. And um, I'm, I'm confident that uh, that relationship will continue to, to grow and, and be rewarding for both of us. And, but more importantly, I think allow us also to, to develop products that we can address the global, you know, a uh, broader global market with. Great stuff. And here's the billion dollar question, uh, Lonnie. Do you believe that it's inevitable? I've always believed it, but <laughs> let me hear what you have to say. Do you think it's inevitable that carriers will need to have a, a Wi-Fi play in place? in the coming years in order to stay competitive? Well, that's an easy question, Klaus. Come on, it's, uh, the future's now. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. But not, all of them, but not all of them are doing it. Is well, I, 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 I would go as far as to say that um, certainly the majority of operators on the planet, certainly the tier ones, have a, a Wi-Fi product. The question is, is how strategic is that Wi-Fi product to them? That's the big issue. Um, and I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this just to oversimplify to make a point, you know, is it, you know, having a, a hotspot is cool and hip and I can talk to the masses or is it a strategic tool that they're looking to, again, um, increase revenues, uh, lower their TCO and to maybe even get to the point where they're making their access networks, you know, much more agnostic. You know, I think that you know, wherever we go, we're certainly seeing operators that are deploying Wi-Fi to um, extend and enhance their, capabil uh, their capabilities um, to provide either better, faster, uh, less expensive, but certainly with greater innovation. 
um, services to their consumers, to the enterprise, um, and we're seeing a much greater focus on IoT. Certainly for those operators that are focusing much on the IoT space today, Wi-Fi must be, and for the most part is, a big part of their, their portfolio. And again, I was talking about um, um, Rethink Research's report earlier this year. There was another piece in that that was talking about that, um, I believe it was 68% of the operators surveyed already have a Wi-Fi product. But, but very interestingly, by 2017, there's going to be 68% of those operators surveyed were going to have a, a much tighter integration of cellular and Wi-Fi to address a whole raft of new services, applications, and value propositions to, to the consumer, as well as capabilities for new business models. So I would go as far as to say, Klaus, the future is now. Um, operators see Wi-Fi for what it is. But to your point, some are looking at it much more strategically than others. Well, very good. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, but I actually really think that this, precisely the space that you're in is absolutely critical for the mobile Wi-Fi convergence story and, and uh, how that moves forward. Because I think a lot of innovation, well, this is my opinion, but I think a lot of innovation and a lot of critical innovation is going to come from the device side, to be honest with you, especially with regards to this issue. Lonnie, we're absolutely delighted to have you, and we're even more delighted that you're coming to Amsterdam next week to share your knowledge with us and your insights, and uh, I look forward to seeing you as always, and have a good trip home, and have a good trip uh, to Amsterdam next week. All right, my friend. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Great stuff. Thanks. All right, thanks to my guests, Edgar Figueroa and Lonnie Schilling. That's it for the show today. And in fact, next week I am off for the first time in 15 weeks because I'm doing Wi-Fi in Amsterdam, the conference. I'll be busy doing that all next week. In two weeks I'm back. I don't know who my guest is going to be. I'm going to find a great guest uh, for all you great viewers out there. And of course, in the meantime, make sure you enjoy all the previous interviews online at Wi-Fi Now. TV, uh, go to the OCR Wireless uh, News uh, YouTube channel to watch those. And don't forget to connect to me, Klaus Hetting, on LinkedIn. As always, great to be here, and uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Wi Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.